I recently unveiled my YouTube channel to friends and family after keeping it under wraps for quite some time. With that reveal has come a whole lot of questions regarding roller coasters and theme parks alike that I believe many enthusiasts have taken for granted. So I'm setting out on a mission to create a video encyclopedia of sorts for those new to the world of roller coasters and theme parks. Welcome to Roller Coasters for Dummies. Episode 1, The Basics. What's up guys, Dr. Coaster here and welcome back to another video on the channel, where today we will be beginning Roller Coasters for Dummies, my quest to educate the general public and all things roller coasters. Before we Larson loop our way into this review, if you haven't already, then be sure to drop the video a like, this helps me fight the YouTube algorithm. While you're at it, subscribe to the channel as well for more roller coaster and theme park content just like this. I guess there's really only one place to start with this series, what is a roller coaster. To put it simply, a roller coaster is an amusement park ride consisting of a car and track, which are controlled by gravity at some point of its layout that, well, rolls through it. Wish it was more complicated than that, but that's pretty much it. So this would not count as a roller coaster, but this sure would. Oh yeah, and if you've ever ridden one of these things, yeah, they are 100% mechanically powered and thus not considered a roller coaster, despite what Six Flags and or your local fares may tell you. So now that we know what a roller coaster is, what defines a roller coaster enthusiast? Besides, of course, smelly, male, and probably broke, and also single, I kid, I kid. But a roller coaster enthusiast, often referred to as a thusi for short, is an individual that enjoys coasters more than a member of the general public, and is willing to travel to great lengths to experience them. Many have Instagram and YouTube pages to document their journeys, just like myself, and they often count the number of coasters they've been on to brag just a little bit too much. The general public, as just mentioned, are your more casual park goers. They are often coined by enthusiasts as the GP, for short. They have lives outside of theme parks, and clog the lines while they are at them. At least that's what enthusiasts like to think. The general public are the big money makers for the parks themselves. They spend the most while at parks, unless it's on nano coasters. And virtually all marketing campaigns are directed towards them. Take Mr. Six, for example. Q lines. Seems rather self-explanatory but they can really make or break a day at a park. Some are boring and bland, like this one here, but others are well-themed and elaborate and help pass the time much less painfully, like this one for Velocicoaster, where you can find it at Universal Orlando. Some are shaded and some are not, and in the same vein, some are air-conditioned and some are not. There really is a big difference. Once you are through the queue line, you will likely notice that every roller coaster looks very different from each other. So let's talk about that a little bit. Every roller coaster consists of a unique height, speed, and layout, so they all look so different. This video is focused on the basics, but I will be making another video on the different types and manufacturers of roller coasters to get into this topic more deeply. Nearly every roller coaster features a lift hill to begin the ride. This then allows gravity to take over for the remainder of the layout, thus making it a roller coaster. Most lift hills consist of a chain lift, and this is what you're probably used to hearing when you're at a theme park. That loud clanking noise is actually the sound of the anti-rollback mechanism that prevents the train from falling back down the lift hill if the ride was to malfunction. So that sound means the roller coaster is working the way it's supposed to. While we're on the topic of safety, I need to introduce what a block zone is, but I am way too underqualified to explain it, so I'm just going to have to pass it off to our buddy Ryan instead. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a block zone is a section of track that only one train may occupy. At the end of a block zone is a method to stop a train in case the block zone ahead is still occupied. This is the safety system that prevents roller coaster trains from colliding with one another. Thank you, Ryan. Now back to lift hills. In more rare instances, some coasters have a cable lift instead of the traditional chain lift. This is equally as safe, but often much quicker and used for taller roller coasters or those that want to whip you over the top a little bit faster. Lastly, some coasters use a launch system to propel the train up the lift hill, just like a chain lift. This can be done at any number of angles, including completely vertical. Every roller coaster also has what is known as a train or a car. While this is also self-explanatory, there are many different types of these. Most traditional roller coasters feature two-person seating and a train of 10 to 12 rows. But a car can have as little as one seat, like on a mountain coaster or even a cruise ship. A train can also have as little as one seat across, or as many as 10, with varying numbers of rows. Each train also features a unique restraint required for the safety of its riders. 
These are easily categorized into lap bars and over the shoulder restraints, with lap bars lowering to the level of your lap and over the shoulder restraints lowering to your torso over your shoulders. Contrary to popular belief, you can go upside down on a roller coaster regardless of whether or not the restraint goes over your shoulders or not. Many modern roller coasters are moving away from over the shoulder restraints in favor of a more comfortable vest or lap bar. While few still exist, there are also some classic coasters remaining with what are known as buzz bars. These are restraints that lock in a single position for all riders. There's also a few head scratchers out there like comfort collars. These pieces of junk are anything but comfortable and should go extinct immediately. Comfort collars attached to a lap bar and then proceed to go over your shoulders to do nothing but get in the way. SeaWorld actually just removed these from their icebreaker roller coaster down in Orlando. So if you'd like to sign a petition to rid the world of these even further, I've left a link in the description to both a video demonstration of why they are trash and the petition themselves. Thank you, Zooter Loopers. The remainder of a roller coaster's layout consists of drops, hills, inversions, and the brakes. These will also be discussed further in a later episode, but these elements serve to manipulate gravity and its effect on the riders. Drops and hills will result in more negative Gs, while inversions and turns typically result in negative, positive, lateral, and even zero Gs. Negative Gs occur when you come out of your seat on a coaster. This sensation is known by enthusiasts and coaster creators as airtime, and it's many of our favorite parts on a ride. Airtime can present itself in multiple ways. The one that you're probably more aware of is that butterfly feeling in your stomach as you float up out of your seat. That is what we call floater airtime, and it most commonly occurs on more rounded first drops and hills. That quick, aggressive, gut punch type of feeling that you get on steeper, more aggressive drops and hills is what we call ejector airtime. This feels like you're being shot straight up out of your seat very abruptly. Some coasters can feature both of these sensations, but it's very often that a ride focuses on one or the other. If you've ridden Goliath at Six Flags Over Georgia, then you definitely know what I'm talking about. The beginning of the ride is focused straight on floater airtime before you get shot out of your seat for the remainder of the ride. Positive Gs are most often experienced pulling up into or out of a sharp transition. This is often experienced immediately before or after an inversion or at any moment during and or following an acceleration while you feel like you're being pinned to your seat. Positive Gs provide that intense feeling like you're being crushed. This is often expressed as a single digit value, such as two, three, or four Gs. One G is the force of gravity exerted on your body at rest. So if a coaster pulls four Gs, you're briefly feeling four times your body's weight in terms of gravity. Few roller coasters reach this level of intensity, but there are still a few standing that pull five and even upwards of six positive Gs. When someone describes an intense ride, they're likely referring to a ride with a high total G-force throughout the ride. If you've ever ridden a roller coaster and get pinned against the sidewall of the train or against one of your friends, then you have experienced what we call laterals. This is just the momentum of our bodies wanting to continue in a straight line while the coaster is turning. You have likely experienced this feeling in a car before as you turn through an intersection at a quick speed. Last but certainly not least, let's touch on zero gravity. Zero gravity can be experienced on many coasters. However, it's typically only on a few select inversions like the one seen here. We'll get into zero G rolls in our inversions episode. So you'll have to come back for that one. Thank you all for watching. I hope you found this educational on some of the basics of roller coasters, or if you're an experienced enthusiast, at least entertaining. I can't wait to continue this series. If there's anything that you want me to address, let me know in the comments below. If you haven't already, be sure to drop the video a like and subscribe to the channel as well for more roller coaster and theme park content just like this. If you want to follow me over on Instagram as well, then you can find me there at Dr. Underscore Coaster. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.